Good afternoon. Happy March 4th. And I'm excited that we are marching forth today in a very big topic. So we will just um, wait for our friends to log on and then we'll crack into a weighty subject with some fun and some prayer. So um, I'm just going to start praying right now and if you are logging in let me know where you're logging in from i always love to see where my friends are watching from so let's just pray okay jesus thank you so much for today lord i just uh, i just surrender these next few minutes to you god i ask father that you guide today's devotion and lord the weightiness that comes when we are working through an offense and trying to stand before you with a clean heart and clean hands i ask jesus that you anoint the words from my mouth i ask god that as our sisters are listening on the other ends they are finding tools to move forward tools to comfort their heart and learning how to live with an offense in the room without being offended. Lord, give us ears to hear and, and a heart to understand. God, I, I just pray for each sister today that is journeying through a pain that feels almost unbearable, almost like it's the death of something, Jesus, as they, as they have to um, tackle maybe the betrayal or even the friendship breakup. Lord, I thank you that today we are going to learn how to walk this slippery slope without being an offender ourselves. I submit this time to you, God, and I thank you that we get this opportunity once again to come to you wholeheartedly and free. In Jesus' name, amen. Good afternoon. I see Robin. Hi, Robin. Thanks for joining. I see um, Cindy. Hi, Cindy. Thanks for joining. I'm not seeing a whole lot of others, but that's all right. We are going to crack in. So I hope you all were able to download the free ebook. I made Unoffendable free for, I think, three days. If you were not able to get it, um, it's still very affordable on Amazon. I think it's $3.99 for the ebook and $6.99 for the hardcover. We are going through this book. There's four chapters. It's very, very small. And one of the ways the Holy Spirit told me to write it was to keep it small because this is a big subject. And so we want to keep it digestible. And so that is what uh, the heart of the book started out with was journeying through my own feelings and going right after it. How many licks does it take to get to the center of the Tootsie Pop, right? We don't want to sit and read a book this big when we need to crack open our chest and get it healed. And so that's what this um, unoffendable, a tiny book for a big problem. And that's where the heart of the book came from was me, myself, journeying through a pain that I needed to learn how to navigate without picking up a platter full of offense that was set before me like hot off the press donuts. And so I'm just gonna write a few things down. I'm gonna read you a few things that I wrote down. And it has been a mantra and a motto, and I say it often on our page, don't become who hurt you. Do not become the person who hurt you. You already know what I'm talking about. Because what happens is when we become these hurting people, then we become herders of people. But healed people will heal people. An offender can become, an off the offended can become the offender when she doesn't heal or forgive. And so I wanna ask you this one question and I ask it in the book. Are you trustworthy with suffering? Those are, that's a hard question, um, but it deserves us to ask the Lord to search our heart because a trustworthy person in, in God's eyes is that when he can trust us with these types of messy people and you have to understand that we are walking in a world full of messy people 
And when we are navigating these situations where messy people come into our lives and they hurt us, they're indifferent, they create drama, they bring to us, they bring to the table a conflict. Are we trustworthy in that in that situation, in that circumstance, or do we come back combative? Do we come back in it to where we're just so mad, we walk away, we can't forgive, we're irritated, and our, we lose our peace, and maybe we lose our cool. And I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna share some moments in my life that I've had to journey and learn and be educated and failed early on in what it meant to be unoffendable. And when I was younger, <clears throat> I was pregnant with Sydney and I mean Joe and I got married we, I was 18 I was pregnant right away had Cody at 19 Riley at 20 Sydney at 21 so you can imagine the conversations that were said about me and I heard through the grapevine good old gossip <clears throat> that a friend of mine was talking smack about me being pregnant again and it devastated me it absolutely devastated me now here's where I failed. As a 21 year old um, woman, very immature, the natural thing to do is ignore her because I don't know what to say, I didn't know what to do, so I just ignored her. And it became awkward and I became, I became indifferent. So I was offended because somebody was offensive and so then I became even more offensive by being indifferent and not wanting to discuss, I didn't wanna, um, talk about it because I was immature and I didn't know how to approach it. And so being this young hurting person, I became quiet. And one day I was sitting down with my kids. We watched these Jesus movies and it was the, it was the movie of Jesus and Judas. And I can remember just rocking Sydney, watching this movie and watching Jesus be so forgiving towards Judas. And the, I related, I was just watching a kid's cartoon because that's basically what you do when you're surrounded in those atmospheres. And, and I just sat and wept because I was one, feeling the relatability at that moment with Jesus and him being so deeply wounded by the betrayal of a friend. And I went, oh, he, he understands. And then I watched just in this little cartoon. I mean, really, I love what Jesus will use anything. And I was shown such a beautiful way of forgiveness from that. And I remember asking the Lord, what do I do? How do I make this right? And now here's the clincher. It's one of the hardest things to do when God is developing somebody in you that maybe a leader, a mentor, an influence, either in church or your business. If you are a godly person and you are walking through these things, you are going to be a leader in it because you are going to be an example of it. And here's what Jesus told me I had to do. He said, I had to tell my friend, I was sorry for letting gossip come between us. Now, this is a hard lesson to learn, sisters when our apology is for our healing. And, and in the beginning of all of this, I hadn't done anything wrong. But my behavior, I became offended and then I became offensive. And so I needed to apologize for that part. Now it's humbling. And so I did just that. I, I did it in a as quick as I could in the, I did it the messy way. And I always say, have a messy conversation, but I did it the messy way. I did it was before church started. I leaned forward and I just told my sister in a very humble and embarrassing way, I'm sorry I let gossip come between us. And she smiled and she forgave me. And the relationship was never the same, but it was healed. And we both learned some mighty lessons in that. Now let's fast forward to where I'm in full-fledged, full-time ministry, I'm traveling, I'm doing conferences, and, and I am doing How the Broken Leader Heals Conference, and this is all about women in leadership and ministry, and, and I have this, it's in chapter one of this book, where, and maybe I should just read it to you guys because I just don't wanna mess this up. I'll just read to you this part of the book 
where where the Lord had me apologize to somebody who was <laughs> creating horrible havoc in my life. They were gossiping about me. They were they were hurting my heart in such a in such a deep way. And so I of course I don't use her real name, so I don't want to I don't want to expose anybody. But I'll let me set the story up for you. There was a time when um so we had some people at our house and the the wife was very very uh we did not know them but they were leaders in the church and they were over at our house and i was shocked at the behavior of the wife how she treated her children and her husband and i didn't know what to do again i'm i'm in ministry and so i see this happen and she comes to me a few days later and she's like is everything okay you've seemed quiet now, I was not being indifferent. I was in actually trying to consider how to approach something. And so I actually told her, you know, I'm actually really surprised. I was really surprised how you treated your family. I, I was shocked at the way you spoke to your children and your husband. And our children were under their leadership. And so this to me was very, very hard because I probably wouldn't have addressed it at that moment, but she came to me trying to settle something, seeing that I was definitely contemplating something. And so I said, I said it in truthfulness, I'm shocked at the way you behaved. Now, had there been some maturity in her to receive what I said, we could have settled it right then and there. But she did what I did in my 20s. She got mad, and but then she catapulted it to disastrous behavior and gossip and it broke my heart it i got a really ugly letter i mean i've had so many of those i'm used to it now but back then i was like come on you came to me i wanted to bring i wanted to settle this now fast forward after that it'd probably been about maybe six or seven years and i woke up to the holy spirit saying i want you the next time you see this woman i want you to apologize to her and i'm like what? I You want me to apologize to her? What Did I do something wrong? Was there something I said? What What is it that makes me have to apologize to this person who was so horrible and actually ran my name through the mud? And here's what the Holy Spirit told me. He said, and these are hard ones, let's face the facts. He said, I want to reinstate her into ministry and she has not been the same since that wound and she won't heal until you say sorry. And so I am like, I don't understand this God. And so here in chapter one, in the very first, like think the first two pages of chapter one, he said, sometimes others need an apology to heal. And here's what Holy Spirit said to me, and I want you guys to take this into consideration. He said, if I can look wrong for the salvation of the, of the guard who nailed me to the cross, you can certainly apologize to Stacy, not her real name. See, the healing a little humbling can do for another is life. And it's a lesson I'll never forget. And you know what ended up happening that day? This is a big lesson I learned when I said yes, that day I went to the dollar store and there Stacy was. And I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm going to go right to her and I'm gonna just going to do what you told me to do. And so when I saw her, I said, you know, I hurt you years ago and I never meant to. And I'm sorry. It was a hard, hard pill to swallow. And again, these are vitamins for the leader. A woman of leadership has to learn how to take these um, giant penicillin pills. And so I went to her and I said, I'm sorry I hurt you. I never meant to. And I was hoping for this moment of restoration. I was thinking God was gonna do something with this, but you know what happened? She said, thank you, and walked away. And then that was that. I never, I have not spoken to her since then. That's probably been 15 years ago. I did, I did what God told me to do. It had nothing to do with, I mean, it had everything to do with her restoration and me learning a big lesson. Because I was 
an unintentional offender in her life. And so because of that, offense in her life made her an offender and she became destructive. And so Holy Spirit wanted to get her back on track. He needed to get her back into being a healer and not a herder. And in order to do that, guess what I had to do? I had to swallow my pride. I had to get over the fact that I was right, no matter what, and I had to go to her and say, I'm sorry. It's like marriage. Sometimes somebody just has to start the conversation. But when I walked away from that, ladies, I was clean. I walked into, I, it was, I was clean when it happened and I was clean when I walked away. Anything else after that was between her and God because healing needed to flow. And it wasn't going to flow until she heard those words, I'm sorry. And what she wanted to do with that was up to her. Now, if you've ever been on the tail end of being offended or being an offender, you, you understand the fact that healing happens when apologies are said. There are many times in my life when somebody has, leadership has wounded my heart. And I know I would have catapulted into healing sooner had I heard and I'm sorry. But because that didn't happen, I had to learn how to navigate through the failures of people that I loved like family and learn how to sit at the table with Johns and Judases and become an unoffendable person. But one of the lessons that Jesus wanted me to learn is if you needed a sorry and you needed an apology to heal, then you've got to be willing to offer those to others, even if you're not wrong. You're offering healing to somebody else. And here's what Proverbs 15, 1 through 2 says. A soft and gentle and thoughtful answer turns away wrath, but harsh and painful and careless words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise speaks knowledge that is pleasing and acceptable, but the babbling mouth of fools spouts folly. That's the Amplified. But it also tells us in verse 4 in the Passion, I love it. When you speak healing words, you offer others fruit from the tree of life. Wow. When you speak healing words, you offer others fruit from the tree of life. You see, leadership at its finest is people who can be trustworthy with another person's pain. And friendship at its finest is somebody who can be trustworthy with another person's wound. Can you come to the table, have a messy conversation, and create a connection even when there's offense involved. But what happens, and now let's just wrap it up with this. What happens when you have a wound from a friend and they will not talk to you? You don't know what happened. There's an offense that's happened. There's this indifference in the room. And you're aching not only from their rejection but you're aching from not understanding what's happened and you're aching from the lack of conversation from understanding. You need some form of conversation to help you understand, did you do something wrong? Or are they just done with you? So when I wrote Unoffendable, that was what I was journeying through. I was journeying through the indifference of the behavior of somebody in leadership that I was, I considered a friend. And when their behavior changed towards me and their body language changed towards me, come on, is anybody understanding what I'm saying? Their body language changed, their behavior changed, everything changed and shifted and there was this ugly atmosphere and only you feel crazy because you're in this and you're like, what's going on? Why does this feel different now? And am I, am I just imagining this? But you know in your knower that something's changed, something's shifted. And there cannot be, there will not be, there's no possibility for a conversation to make it better. Has anybody experienced such a situation in their life that they've had to journey through the betrayal and indifference of a friend. I mean, imagine what Joseph went through while he was sitting in a pit, wondering 
Why couldn't he have just sat down and had a conversation with his brothers? And I'm going to end with this little bit here that the Holy Spirit gave me. Because it's enheartening. It's disheartening when you can't have that conversation that desperately needs to lead to forgiving and lead to healing. But you want to be a mature, godly woman, so you want to be able to navigate this without being offended. However, you're hurting so deeply that you're feeling offended and you're feeling angry and sin is stirring up inside of you. You're feeling the stirring that this person is now treating you differently. You have nothing to pin it down with. And you're, not only are you hurting, but you're angry. And not only are you feeling angry, but you're feeling toxic because you can't get it out of your head. You replay it over and over and over. Am I preaching to the choir? Is anybody picking up what I'm putting down? We want to navigate towards healing, but how do we do it? And here's what Holy Spirit told me to do. This is how you hurt, ladies. You hurt towards your healing. The thing is, when somebody betrays us and rejects us, or worse, when they're indifferent, because indifferent doesn't even, doesn't give you the courtesy of rejection or hatred. It, it treats you as if you are non-existent. And I think that's worse than somebody being angry at you because angry, there's emotions. Indifference, they're so detached from you. They've moved on without you and your heart is broken. I don't know if anybody else feels that way, but I certainly do. And I asked the Lord, what do I do? This is messy. What do I do with this? Because I am, I am this girl who who wants to walk alongside you in ministry. I'm that girl who wants to be a cheerleader. I want to help you go after your goals. I, I want to journey with you. I, I'm a trustworthy friend. I know I am. And so when that's rejected, it feels personal. But it's, it's persecution at its finest. And here's what the Holy Spirit told me. He said, Holly, the only way you can journey through these moments is you hurt towards your healing. You have to hurt. Hurting is part of healing. But when we begin to try to become angry and we don't let our hurting heal us, but we let our hurting, we want to mask it. We want to suppress it. We want to, we want to um, rush through the hurt then we're not going to get to the part where we're unoffendable. Because if we try to rush through that hurting part and we become, anger can guard us. Listen, we have a right to be angry and we have a right to be bitter many times, but it hurts us. It's like there's a Mark Twain saying that says, um, unforgiveness, anger or unforgiveness is like um, drinking poison, expecting another person to die. And I went, when I read that, I went, man, that's a really good one. I wish I would have put it in the book. Because when we live with this unforgiveness in our lives, it's drinking a toxicity, hoping it affects another person. It's not going to work, sisters. We just have to hurt until we heal. And so when you are going through these seasons of betrayal and you're asking God, how long do I have to wait? How long is this going to be until I feel whole again? This feels like a death. This doesn't, this feels like an amputation. This betrayal from this friend, this leader, this family member, my, uh, maybe it was a sibling or a child that has wounded you so deeply and they're treat, they've cut you off. They've cut you off and you can't have a conversation to heal. How do you, what do you do? And here's what, not only do we hurt towards our healing and letting things go is a daily practice. You get up, you feel it, you feel the hurt, there it is. It's the first thing that wakes you up in the morning and you have to let it go again. One of the hardest things a person can do is forgive somebody who's not sorry. They're not even apologetic. They have, they don't have a sorry on their lips. But you are going to walk with forgiveness. And my friend Amber says, I choose to purposely forgive. She says those words. And I think it's a really great line for us to say when we are feeling these indifference towards us. Because we can be asking God, how long will you let me look? How long will you let their gossip run rampant and make me look like I'm wrong? Well, 
How long did David run in the wilderness while Saul sat on a throne? How long did Joseph wait to be brought to the palace? How long was Esther an orphan before she was a queen? How long did Daniel serve in exile? How long did Jesus walk with Judas? Many times it's the rejection and betrayal and offensive way of those we love that actually sets us up towards our path of purpose because we begin to learn another level of grace. We begin to learn another level of maturity. We begin to, um, cr the pure and clean heart begins to be scoured because of offense. Our hearts get scoured. If you could imagine with me offense like a Brillo pad, and when you're experiencing these wounds and, and the enemy wants to shred your heart with it, he wants to destroy your peace with it, and God says, wait, wait, wait. Let's use this pain as a sharpening stone, as a Brillo pad, and let's get away. Let's just clean away things that are impure in your heart because offense, if it can be used properly in your life, can actually remove grudges and remove this, I have a right. Ladies, we laid down that right. When we accepted Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, we laid down a right to be offended. And instead, we chose to be more like him and be forgiving. And we are never more like Jesus than when we forgive an offense. We are never more like Jesus than when we forgive somebody. And I said it in the beginning and I'm gonna finish with it. If Jesus, if Jesus can look wrong for the guard, the guard was nailing his hands, assuming his leaders were right, that this man is a, is a, is a <clears throat> false prophet. This man is this leader of the Jewish people, is this false king. He has caused destruction and he's brought this um, dissension. And so this Roman soldier is just doing what he's told, believing the lies, crucifying Jesus. And Jesus is laying there with his hands being nailed to the cross and the Roman soldier is nailing him and Jesus is looking wrong for his salvation. He is appearing in this place of not just sacrifice, but in this utter total forgiveness. Now, now hear me. We're not meant to be doormats and we're not meant to lay our life down in that in such a way that we let people abuse us so i hope i hope you hear me in this if you're in if you're in an abusive situation you don't throw yourself on the sword and let yourself be hit over and over and over again or brutalized that is not what i'm talking about i'm talking about these moments in our life when we know that offense can either make me a better person because I allow it to purify me or it can make me a bitter person because I allow it to make me an offender. We have choices to make today, sisters, because there is so much garbage going on that we are surrounded by that is offensive. And there are so many people with their mantras on the left and on the right and on the front and in the back. And we as Christians can be divided over some of the lamest stuff because we can't find common ground and we can't respect and honor each other. We've lost the ability to honor somebody's opinions. And if somebody believes something wrong and somebody believes something that is contradictory to what you believe, it's not going to be us whacking them upside the head with our Bible or our recent book of truth that we've just read that's going to bring change. It's not going to do it. And rather than get offended and just um, write them off in your life, instead learn how to approach it differently. Some of them are deceived. Some of them believe what they're believing with such fervency like you do. And so you've got to find a common ground. But if they are being cruel, this is different. But if you are being cruel, this is different. And so 
if you can see the knife's edge of this, and I hope I am, I hope I'm explaining this properly. If you can see the knife's edge of walking unoffendable when there's offense, and you can see that you can easily be an offender or you can be an offended when there's this mess going on. That if we can walk like Jesus did, and if we can sit at the table with the beloved and the betrayer, and we can wash both their feet, and we can eat with them, and we can share with them life, knowing that some are trustworthy and some aren't, then that shows us exactly how to give ourselves to the people that are in front of us. It shows us who to be guarded with, who to have boundaries with. Being an unoffended person doesn't mean you walk around just exposing your heart to anybody. It means you walk with wisdom saying, you're not a safe person, you're not a trustworthy person, so I can't give you pieces of my life. That will prevent offense in your life. And then when you have somebody who you know needs healing, you need to be a trustworthy person to make sure that they can tip into the healing side of life and become whole and restored. And if that means sit, sitting down with somebody and even apologizing that you might have hurt them. Now, there's this really great um, line that you can say that maybe you have clean hands and you have done nothing wrong but somebody needs to have a conversation to heal. And I don't want to sound trite with this because I do think it's important that we are sorry somebody is hurt. We're sorry if I hurt you, like I did with the young woman. I'm sorry if I hurt you. I didn't mean to. What that does is life and life abundantly because we just cracked open heaven and let it fall on them like rain because we brought to them what the kingdom of heaven is all about. It's grace, 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 grace. And we've, we poured it out with a little bit of humility. And so <clears throat> let's be unoffendable. We're gonna get together next week and we're gonna go into chapter two. I encourage you to get the book. I'll put a link to it. Um, get the book, get, get caught up on chapter one. We're gonna go into chapter two. And we are just going to continue to learn how to live a life that's, that is unoffendable, full of grace, and willing to sit down with those we disagree with. And those who are indifferent, we're going to let them go. We're going to hurt. We're going to heal. And we're going to become better people because we're going to allow offense to be a Brillo, bat, Brillo pad and, and not sh shards of glass shredding us to bits. Let's pray. Jesus, I just bring my sisters to you. Lord, I thank you, Father, that we have this time that we can come together and learn the importance of heaven's, heaven's strategy in an offendable atmosphere. When there are people on both sides that, that can be hurtful, when there are trust, people we thought were trustworthy, either stab us in the back or don't talk to us at all. Lord, you have given us tools on how to be unoffendable in a hurtful situation. And Lord, we know that in due time, after, after persecution and after such ugliness, we know, Lord, that in due time there's harvest because of this, that you develop in us not just a leader, Father, but you develop in us an a atmosphere changer because, Lord, we've learned to bring a depth of grace that was lacking in our life. We've learned to bring in a richness of mercy that we did not have before the wound. We learned to bring in the very nature of Jesus because we experienced a similar situation of betrayal. Lord, that, that couldn't have been taught without the painful situation. And I thank you, Lord, that you don't waste our pain that you don't waste these moments and that when somebody betrays us, Father God, you are so close. You are so close to us as we're sucking carpet, weeping from the grief, weeping from the death of a friendship, from the, from the, when we have to change churches because it hurts too much to go on Sunday morning, when we have to actually stay home, stay home and heal as if we were in surgery and we just have to heal 
hurt and heal. God, you don't shame us because we hurt. And I thank you, God, that you are the one who restores us and puts our legs back in right standing. You sturdy us. Isaiah 41.10, you harden us and you strengthen us towards difficulties. You uphold us with your righteous right hand. And I praise you, God, that you are solidifying yourself, your nature, your character in us when we walk through offense unoffendable. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Sisters, I love you. I hope that this ministered to you and you are feeling empowered to move forward with a pain that doesn't have to own you. Have an amazing weekend.